Good afternoon or good morning or good middle of the night for some of you. This is Jan Dommerhalt at Myopain Seminars together with uh, my colleague Nate Mayberry. And Nate, how are you doing today? You ready for this? Doing well, Jan. Thanks for asking. I'm ready. Looking forward to presenting this. Very good. So now, in case you don't know who we are, uh, I'm the owner and president of Myopain Seminars. And then Nate is one of our instructors in the dry needling program. And we actually work together in the clinic as well, where we practice the playground approach, the topic of today's uh, webinar. Uh, we have people from many, many countries around the world. I just saw people from Australia, from Iran, from Pakistan, from Qatar, United States, and many, many others. So welcome. Some of you, it's I think like two o'clock in the morning. So I really appreciate uh, you're taking the time and uh, going to bed this late, but we're all in COVID lockdown, I suppose. So what else is there to do at two o'clock in the morning? So welcome to the webinar. Um, a few technical, a few logistics uh, points first before we get started. Um, almost every webinar, there are a few people who have difficulty with the sound or difficulty with seeing the presentation itself. Uh, if that happens, Usually the best thing to do is to either check your sound settings or log out and log back in. And usually it resets it. It's often a problem at, at your end as far as available network and bandwidth and things like that. So if that's an issue, just log out and log back in. Uh, you all will get in about two, three days, you will get a link to this presentation. The whole presentation is being recorded. So if you miss parts of it, um, the first person already came in and not hearing anything. Um, so the key to that is to really probably log out, log in. But if that happens, well, we're going to answer you individually as well. Our support staff is, is doing that. Um, so we're going to get started. Why do we do this webinar? Uh, it's a really, let me turn on the presentation itself. There we go. And then Nate, will, you will see him back later again when he comes back in. Uh, to do his part of the presentation. So for those of you in the Middle East, this is a playground in Kuwait at the Corniche. Um, but we're going to not talk about much about playgrounds, that's just what we called it. So a few years ago, I was introduced to an, um, a program here in our region in Maryland in the United States that had a pretty unique way to look at exercise. And um, it was quite astonishing what the results were from, and it was very different than what we typically do in physical therapy. So we joined forces, we formed a partnership, we opened the phys physical therapy clinic in this program called Physio Fit and uh, Fitness for Health. And uh, after a while working in that clinic, we started looking at now why does this work so well? What is the secret to, to these programs? And so today we're going to share with you some of the research behind a different way that most physiotherapists or osteopaths or other health clinicians uh, work with our patients. So if we look at the, the why of the, there you go, we're going to talk about the effectiveness of this approach. We call it the playground approach. That's just a name that's one of our course participants came up with. Uh, we're going to talk about how this approach helps people with kinesiophobia, particularly people with chronic pain conditions. We also see that it's actually a lot more fun. So when we talk about functional training, we are also going to put the word fun back in functional training because it, exercise should be fun. Otherwise people will have very poor compliance. So we're going to talk about a lot of different things. We're talking about, talking about a poor EIH. And we're going to explain to you what it is. And we hope to show you some of the evidence of this approach of why we think this is actually maybe a little bit better. Uh, but we're not going to teach you exactly how to do this because there's lots of different ways to do that. Just like playgrounds come in many different shapes and forms. These are playgrounds from around the world. In Japan, in the Netherlands, of course, United States, and a couple of others. Um, you can implement this approach in many, many possible ways. And there is no really one way to do this. It's, it's more about the principle, how do we do exercise? How do we teach our patients to do exercise, particularly with respect to chronic pain patients? Um, we do know from the pain science literature, here is a quote from Adrian Law with a, a chapter in one of our textbooks on manual therapy for musculoskeletal pain syndromes, or musculoskeletal pain syndromes, some of you will say, 
Uh, it's clear that people in chronic pain have difficulty with exercise or even with specific movement patterns. So I think you've all noticed that when we uh, have patients with chronic pain conditions, you give them exercises and it's almost like it doesn't get into their brain. And when you, they come back the next time, they don't really remember what you talked about. They don't remember the details. One of the reasons is that probably in chronic pain conditions, the motor cortex is partly utilized as part of the pain neuro matrix. And other processes, the pain processing, take over the, the brain, and there's really almost no space left, so to speak, for uh, motor patterning. But there are other reasons as well. For example, normally when you are not in pain, exercising actually usually feels good. It may be hard to get, get started, but once you exercise, most people feel, oh, we had a great workout. And that's because of what's called exercise-induced hypoalgesia. So you usually feel better. If you're a little sore to start with, maybe a little tired at the end of the day, once you exercise, you usually feel better. Now, so certainly in the lockdown here, we, we often go for a walk at night. And usually, even if you don't want to, but at the end, it usually feels a little bit better because we actually created hyperalgesia. We feel a little bit better. And, hyper, and exercise induced hyperalgesia is dependent on lots of factors of the immune system, of the uh, autonomic nervous system, the endocannabinoid system, et cetera, et cetera, psychological effects, et cetera. In chronic pain patients, exercise may have little or no effect on pain or in many times it actually increases the pain experience and that's probably because it activates descending facilitatory mechanisms making it actually worse and the other thing with people with chronic pain since they have augmented central nociceptive processing really in the central nervous system facility the result of that is that the lowered pain threshold leads to an increase in pain and if you look at their fitness levels they may be reasonably fit if they were very athletic before they had this chronic pain condition but you cannot really rely on their fitness level to predict the level of exercise because you don't really know how they're going to respond and whether their eih response actually is, is uh, functional if the exercise induced hyperalgesia is not functional any level of exercise could potentially make it worse that of course leads to less motivation and less enthusiasm to exercise it condition leads to more deconditioning it probably leads to depression and very important also to poor self-efficacy which means the patient is not going to do the exercises and then we tend to say well you didn't do your exercises so no wonder you're not getting better in healthcare there tends to be a tendency to uh, to blame the patient for the lack of progress and maybe it's because what we teach people is not necessarily the most interesting thing to do. I would say that many of the exercises that I've taught patients in the past were rather boring and I, we shouldn't be surprised that people are not doing their exercises. In fact, people only at best, maybe 50% of the patients do our home exercises. Up to 70%, as you see in this slide, are not doing their home exercises. We see that in many different conditions, there are many studies on this. This is an older paper that summarizes it quite nicely. In this paper, they said they found that on average, 64% of physical therapy patients actually complied with the exercises while they were in treatment. But as soon as the treatment stopped, it dropped to 23%, and in some cases, even lower. So we may think that we are very successful in giving people exercise, but again, most exercises are probably boring. The, the uh, scientific basis is quite poor. Uh, people with back pain, 70% are not doing their home exercises, no matter how, thick, how good you are and how many core stability exercises you give them. And the question is also, is that really the best way to exercise? What is really the emphasis for core stability in preventing and treating back pain? Even in the non-musculoskeletal world, in cardiac surgery, the numbers were exactly the same. If you look at this slide, 364 patients, so that's quite a few, had cardiac surgery, mostly bypass surgery. 70% either did not complete the program in exercise or never showed up. So 42% did not complete, 28% did not show up. And again, we're back to the 70% we saw in back pain as well. So why are people not complying? Well, that's not that easy to answer. Research shows that there are actually over 200 different factors related to compliance. 
Uh, one of the factors that we believe, and we have some patients tell you that story themselves, is that we believe that most exercise is very boring. Um, we put people with shoulder dysfunction in the corner of the room and tell them to push against the walls. Well, would you do that every day? And then we give people arbitrary numbers of repetitions. Uh, I pay you five pebbles a session to be my personal trainer, to be my physical therapy, my osteopath, but all we do ever do is swim. So I'm going to introduce you to one of our patients. She's an elderly lady. I hope you can understand and this. Can you tell me a little bit about what makes physical therapy here different than other physical therapy you've been to? Um, well, I think this maybe isn't the right first thing to say, but I, it's really fun. And, um, that uh, I look forward to coming uh, because it's quite unlike anything I've ever done before at physical therapy. Um, working in the gym uh, is uh, with all the different kinds of um, equipments and playing games is, is really fun. So she, I hope you could understand that. So there's the sound of videos embedded in video in the, the presentation. It's a little hard to get at home. But basically she said, it's so much fun. That's the first thing that comes to mind. So fun is really important. Fun and function should go together. This study you see in the screen now is quite interesting because it shows that physical therapists, they were the subject of this study, actually have difficulty giving people specific exercises based on their impairments and their pain patterns and at the same time empower people to take control by undertaking exercise that they find fun or enjoy it. And, and what you see here in the video in the background and in, in the corner is actually in, in our clinic um, where a patient with, you'll see her later, we introduce her in a case report with, with some foot and ankle problems is doing activities and she never thinks about a foot and ankle. So this would be a good time to introduce you to a new theory of motor learning uh, called the optimal theory of motor learning. This is not something that we put together. This is something we learned about as we're trying to figure out why do these exercise programs with fun equipment work so well. So this is the result of 20, 20 plus 25 years of research by uh, Gabby Wolf and a German researcher living in the United States in Nevada and Rebecca Luthway, the kinesiologist at the University of Southern California. So these two uh, researchers have worked many, many, many years and did many, many studies to come up finally in, 1970, in 2016 with the optimal theory of motor learning. Um, this is not very well known within physical therapy, which is one of the reasons we do this webinar, because I think, and Nate and I both believe, and others as well, that this may be something you want to look into because it, in our clinic, it made all the difference in the world as we're going to show you with a few of our patients. So what does optimal stand for? It's actually an acronym for optimizing performance. So that's first, performance is important, through intrinsic motivation and attention for learning. So performance, motivation, attention for learning. Those are the three components that we're going to look at. So one of the things that are very important, not just in exercise, but in life, I suspect, is to take a look at how can these three aspects, uh, what you see in motivation, and motivation falls under autonomy and enhanced expectancies. We're going to review all these. And the attention is really what we call external focus. How can you combine those aspects and see what uh, to actually have people perform better? Well, of course, we'd like to have optimal performance, but optimal performance is actually quite rare. Um, we can do the best we can do. I mean, some patients do this up to a very high athletic level. Other people really have difficulty overcoming the kinesiophobia. And even for them, it's very useful to use this model of the optimal motor learning theory. So the first thing we're going to look at is autonomy. Autonomy is one of the main features of this approach and uh, important to really consider in pretty much everything we do as physical therapists, whether it's exercise or something else. It doesn't really matter that much. So if we look at autonomy, you see from golf balls to PT practice, because they have done a lot of research on the importance of having giving patients a sense of autonomy. So when patients have a sense that they actually are have a level of control, a level of self-determination, 
immediately affect their level of motor performance and their learning skills. So if we tell patients today we're going to do this, they will probably not following through as well. And actually their motor performance will be affected negatively than when we ask patients, now what do you think we should work on today? And there's lots of studies on that. One that I find really intriguing is a study that uh, Luthwait and, and Wolf and some other people also did in a putting exercise playing golf. When they actually gave the golfers a particular colored ball, whether it's red, blue, orange, or green, didn't matter. They said, here, you have the green ball today. And they started putting to see how well can you do this putting exercise? Can you get the ball in the hole? Or the other scenario, if they say, said to people, why don't you pick your favorite color? In the scenario where people could pick their own ball, their favorite colored ball, the motor performance was significantly better. They were putting more accurately than when they were told what ball, ball to use. So the choice of the golf ball color actually produced different learning differences and learning experience and better motor performance. So that's quite interesting because if you apply this in the practice, to look at the patient's opinion versus more like today we're going to work on this a more clinician's authoritarian control pattern but actually value the patient's input, patients do better. The optimizing motivation and attention motor performance and learning, another paper in 2017, actually made a big difference. The patient you see here has Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and she is performing an external focus exercise. Again, we're gonna talk about it in much more detail. Uh, this patient was actually told by one of her prominent surgeons to amputate her foot to see how well that go and if that reduced the pain to amputate her whole leg. Well, once she came to our clinic and started exercising with these principles in mind, there's no reason she has the need to have an amputation. It was kind of a crazy advice to start with. Other scenarios where you also can see this is in kickboxing. If the trainer, the coach says to the, the, the kickboxers, today we're going to work on this, this routine, or give them the choice, what do we need to work on based on last week's match? If the players, if the athletes have the choice of what we're going to work on, they actually performed better, they punched harder, higher impact forces, and they were much faster. Same principle applies in the physical therapy practice. If you give patients autonomy, and not just fake autonomy, but real autonomy, they have a significant say in what you're going to do today, they will perform better from a motor learning perspective and from a performance level. So let's look at the next component of the optimal motor learning theory, and that's enhanced expectancies. Um, and that's very important as well. It's a slightly different aspect, but enhancing expectancies, like actually creating an atmosphere where the patient is going to expect that they will do well, that they can do things. Um, actually, attention priming and prior prioritization, it hide heightens the attention to task relevant cues rather than body relevant cues. So all the stuff that's not so important, they really don't have to worry about so much. And this is actually a very complex particular principle because it works at many, many levels. There's a cognitive components to that, there's an attentional components, a behavioral components, neuromodular components, and probably the dopaminergic, dopaminergic system of the brain plays a role in that through the time, uh, thalamus most likely, although we, that's all not clear yet. But if people believe they're going to be successful, if they believe they're going to have a better outcome that they can actually do things, it is quite incredible, just like this cat. As uh, Rosalind Carter said a long time ago, you have to have confidence in your ability, then be tough enough to follow through. So when people do well with exercises, exercises they can do that are fun, here you see actually one of our physical therapists demonstrating blaze pods. These are lights that you can program in any direction, any color you want. Uh, but if it works and if people can do it, if you make this task too fast that no one can be effective, it's very, it's not very motivating. But if you set up the clinic, if you set up the exercises where people know they're going to be successful, where they can enhance the expectations for the future performances, hey, I could do this really well today. I didn't think I could do this. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I did this. Success in an activity will actually potentiate even more success and more improvement and more better learning. So the motor performance improves. 
Again, this is the young lady again who was told that her foot needed to be amputated. So our partner in this clinic, and you see him here, how it did work. This is Mark Sickle, who's actually one of the attending this webinar today. Has a great line, success builds success. Everything, nothing is impossible. So when we talk about enhanced expectancies, many people say, well, is that the same as placebo? Not really, but they're very, very closely linked together. Here you see on the screen in the top right corner an, an article we wrote about this whole approach last year in, in German, it's in a German pain journal. Um, but a lot of the information is in this webinar as well. And of course, in the, in the course that is associated with this webinar, um, enhanced expected simplicity was a very closely related. Yeah, to create motivational factors that will enhance positive outcomes, clinicians should administer placebos intentionally. So use placebo. Placebo is not a dirty word. Placebo is actually something that patients will respond to. We all respond to placebo. So by creating placebo environments, yeah, where people have really high expectations, we're gonna talk about what is now placebo, uh, the enhanced motivation will improve and the positive outcomes will improve. At the same time, doing this will foster self-efficacy. We'll talk about that as well. So if we look at placebo, I love the line, a placebo is a story we tell ourselves that changes the way our brain and our body work. So placebo really is, in the more medical terms, is a medical procedure designed to deceive the patient in the clinical experiment. Yeah, when people get a placebo pill or something else, but it produces a physical effect on the individual. And we can use placebo in our clinics. In another study by, uh, by Luthwaite, they actually also the golfers and they had a certain putter. And when they said, oh, I have a really special putter for you here. Why don't you take this one? It actually belonged to a famous golfer. It didn't matter who the famous golfer was and whether it was true or not. When people knew they were putting with the, put with the, the putter of a famous golfer, they actually performed more accurately. Whether it was true or not, it didn't matter. If the people wanted to believe this must be a really good putter, putter because so-and-so used it in their career and look how wonderful they are. So placebos are true biopsychosocial treatment options. We should not shy away from them that can generate enhanced expectancies and therefore an enhanced therapeutic response. If you look at self-efficacy, self-efficacy is the belief in, one, in your own capabilities to organize and execute, execute course of action to get certain results. So Bandura, a researcher at Yale University, has done a lot of work on that. But self-efficacy is very important. Many of our patients with kinesiophobia, they're afraid to move, they're afraid to do anything, have all kinds of self-perceived ideas, have very poor sense of self-efficacy. And once people are successful, and once people are moving again, in a way that they don't really associate with exercise, it's just having fun, um, successful completion of motor tasks improves patient self-efficacy and is predictive of how well they will do in the future. So if patients are convinced they can't bend down because they have a weak back, as they may say. Most of our patients don't have weak backs because they walked into our clinic, they're fine. But if once they could do activities where they use their back in a way that they didn't really think about it, it will actually improve physical functioning in the future, the health status, it lowers the pain intensity and disability, decrease the activity of, of the, the painful back, works positively for depression, fatigue, and actually tender points and trigger points will be less sensitive. So self-efficacy is one of the other parts of enhanced expectancies. So many of our patients in our clinic, we see mostly people with chronic pain, you look at this chart, they don't say, I won't do it, but they almost always say, I can't do this. I already tried this with my other physical therapist who told me to walk and to do this. And patients have all kinds of excuses why they can't do exercises. Oh, I tried to do setups, make my back hurt more. But once you put in an environment where you enhance expectancies and you give people autonomy and very important, give them an external focus of attention, which we're gonna talk about next, most of our patients, after the first time they're into our exercise gym or in our playground, if you want, 
after 45 minutes of running around and chasing balls or hitting targets, hitting lights and doing all kinds of other activities, high tech and low tech, many of our patients says, I can't believe I did this. This is the first time in five years that I've been able to do anything. I'm sweating actually, I haven't sweat like this in years. Oh my gosh. That enhanced expectancy will set them up for the next time where they will do much better. The last component is focus of attention. And I'm gonna talk about what does it mean to go from internal focus of attention to an external focus of attention. And we're gonna specifically focus on exercise, external focus exercise. So if you're wondering what this is, this is the roof of a building in Iran actually, where I went to visit a few years ago. I know one of our participants is from Iran. I'm not sure you recognize it, but I'll ask you later in an email. So external focus is the attention component of the optimal mode of learning theory. And so let's talk about what that means. So internal focus and external focus are not necessarily mutually exclusive. We do some internal focusing as well, because sometimes it's really hard to do strict external. But an internal approach would be the physical therapist, as you see in this picture, telling the patient, put your left hand on your right shoulder, lift up your elbow and push against my hand. Don't lift your shoulder, keep your head in the mid position. And what you see here, there's a lot of words that pertain to the patient's own body. Your right hand, left, left hand, right shoulder, lift your elbow, keep your neck, your head, your shoulder, whatever. An external approach does not concern itself with the patient's body parts. It focuses on function, fun function, by giving patients an external focus where they can knock out lights, where they can chase a ball, where they can hit the, the ball with a tennis racket, or you'll see several other activities. So examples of internal focus are things you're probably pretty familiar with. If you look at this little exercise sheet, Shoulder push-ups, place your hands on the wall. I highlighted all the body language. The shoulder height, bend your elbows, bring your face to the wall. It is a very strong internal focus. It is probably not very functional and indeed rather boring. Here's another example, same thing. Stand up to a leg up on the step, wait over the lead, your leg. You probably recognize these things. Keeping your ball of the foot on the trailing foot lifted up. I'd say, well, this is more internal focus and probably just as boring. Another example of an exercise approach some of you may be familiar with. If you don't have the time to read it, and in the end, we are going to give you this video presentation so you can take all your time, you can stop the video and read this slide on at your, at your leisure. The left side, your knees, your left toes, your nose, everything gets involved. I don't even know what to say about that. I mean, who can follow these kind of activities? So internal versus external means that in an internal approach, the focus is, on, is directed at the patient's own body and the patient's body movements. I'm gonna show you a video. It's a totally random video I, I copied from YouTube. And I want you to count, I do it for you actually, how many times this instructor uses body language. There we go. So way to go again, cool. Have your hand just below shoulder height. Keep your elbows not locked out, but pretty straight the whole time. What you're gonna do is you're gonna press out as far as you can, and then squeeze the shoulder blades together. Now, if this one is feeling like, I oh, got this, this isn't hard. Put it just around your forearms, doesn't matter where. So again, make sure that there's just a little bit of resistance. You're keeping your arms about shoulder width apart. As you can see, in just a few seconds, she mentioned body parts seven times. And the video, if you continue it, it will go on and on and on. And external focus, if you use an external focus, we would not talk at all about your body. We would give you an external focus which is always directed at the effects that movement will have on the environment. Now, there are a few studies that have looked at both. And this study from Spain actually said, well, there's an internal focus actually had a few advantages. They used to look at EMG output at controlled speed in internal focus when they actually focused on the muscles, patients had a greater EMG output. No difference were noticed during explosive speeds. So this research says, well, you, there's, a, there's support for internal. In another study from the same research group, and people did bench presses, they also said, well, 
we focus on controlling those packs and contracting those packs, we will have greater EMG output. The problem is that there is really little relationship between EMG output and performance. Remember the optimal motor learning theory? It's optimal performance. So studies that have looked at it, is it really, really true? Well, EMG output has very little output on, on performance. So first exercise I'm going to give you, when you go back to your clinic tomorrow, if you are going to the clinic, maybe you're locked down and you're not allowed to see patients yet, but next, whenever you go back to your clinic, I'd like you to focus on give patients an exercise program without mentioning any body parts. So no mention of shoulders, elbows, wrist, hands, head, stomach, feet, feet et cetera, any body part. You'll be amazed. We do this in the actual live course of this, this webinar, and it is one of the toughest exercises we can give our students. No, we give you a case scenario, give this person an exercise program without mentioning body parts. But that's the key. So we, rather than having a body focus, with a plank exercise or other things, we have a target focus. We actually have a laser room like that in our clinic. If our patients focus on avoiding getting hit by laser lights, they are contracting the stomach muscles just as well as in the plank and probably even better. Let me introduce you to one patient real quick. She came to me at the end of the year, a few several years ago. Her name is Nina. She had suboccipital headaches for 14 years. She was bedridden for six after two major car accidents. She was treated by many physical therapists who all used an internal focus approach. She also was seen by physicians who did PRP injections and other things. We combined her initial treatment with a, lot of, a little bit of dry needling and a lot of pain science education. So session one, we did some treatment of oblique capitis inferior with dry needling combined to pain science education. Session two, she came back, she said, I'm so confused because I've had a few days without headaches. We did more dry kneeling in both sternocleidomastoid, both oblique capitis inferior, and more education, emphasizing that there is no link between her perceived pain and tissue damage. Session three, we added some spinal male mobilization. Session four, she said, I am really, really confused. I have had no headaches since the last time I saw you. So session five, we brought it to our playground clinic, as I like to call it, and here you see her with different activities. As you can see, all these activities have an external focus. She either hears sounds, she has sees lights flashing, and the one on the, in the left corner with the yellow balls, those are actually weights. She is doing strengthening exercises now, but she is playing a game. Two months before that, enough six weeks before that, this lady could not brush her own hair. She could not lift her arms high enough. Later that year, five months later, she completed the 5K. She was started training for a 10K, and now she's actually accepted into law school after she gave her career as a CPA, as an accountant. So just a quick example. We used an external focus, almost exclusively in combination with pain science education and a teeny little bit of dry needling in the beginning. So let me introduce you to some real basic experiments. If you have a patient in the clinic with a fitter or any kind of device like this, it doesn't have to be this. And when you say, push your right foot out, or you change the language to push the plate as far as you can go, an internal versus an external approach, and a control group where you don't say anything, you will always see again and again and again, and there are many experiences like that. When you say foot, patients perform the worst. They automatically restrict their movement. They automatically restrict their performance. When you say something external, move the plate, they do much better. In a different example, these are studies from Wolf. A patient on an unstable surface of a subject, unstable surface, has a box, and in that box is a ping pong ball. If you tell this individual, keep your hands still, internal focus, or if you tell them, keep the box still, guess what? They do much better when you say, keep the box still. And the scan in the research shows the same thing. The external approach is now at the bottom, much less deviation in the movement of the box and of the ball. So the external focus has immediate beneficial impacts on performance, retention, how well do they transfer that activity? How well can they retain this activity immediately? So performance retention and transfer with an external focus, people are more accurate in hitting the target. They produce more force 
and they create a much more balanced, maintain a much more balanced position. With an external focus, we also see that an external focus clearly has an, an effect on accuracy, force generation, motor planning and force production. So these are studies by Keith Lose. He's done a lot of work on this as well. And external forces improve movement efficiency. People are more efficient with less muscular activity needed to do the task, better kinetic and better oxygen consumptions. And it's not just limited to one muscle. When you give people external focus exercise, like you see here, this lady is going through the alphabet, Hitting the letters in whatever sequence you want them to do. Not only is the recruitment more effective within muscles, but also between muscles where the intermuscular coordination improves as well. And we don't really mention this to the patients. We just let them experience how much better their performance is. And by doing that, these patients have better self-esteem, better confidence in their own ability, in the abilities, the self-efficacy. And it's usually a lot of fun. It's also a lot of fun for the physical therapist. This is much more fun than telling people to crawl in the corner and push against the wall. So here's another one of our patients. I've been to several other physical therapy clinics that are very close to home, but they didn't treat me right. So instead of getting better, I got worse. And coming here has actually improved everything. So. So we showed you a lot of high-tech equipment. We also have very low-tech equipment here as well. Six months ago, um, Cassie was barely getting up off the sofa. And this is in another clinic from us. We have two clinics and right in this picture, there's a patient with balance issues. She's standing on an unstable service and she's standing in a picture of uh, New York, an old picture of Times Square, New York City. She has two sticks in her hand, one's with a red dot and one's with a green dot, or with a, a blue dot, I think. And one is for vowels and one is for constants. So I never said use your right hand to do vowels or the left hand because that would be internal focus. Now the red dot is for vowels, the green dot is for constants. Can you spell your name? External focus, she never had any problems with the balance. And when I gave her an internal focus, she almost fell on the floor. So an in external focus leads to, again, to an improved performance, even when you don't say anything else, it goes automatically. And the desired outcome that you and I may have as physical therapists and, and other clinicians is almost achieved as a byproduct. Although in our planning, we of course, we want to see that, that, that uh, outcome. So research shows that if you look at task-specific fears, you know, lumbar range of motion, chronic back pain is predicted by task-specific, not general measure of pain-related fear. When reducing the task-specific fear with the automatic lead to normalization, and if that's the case, we can actually help people treating kinesiophobia. Kinesiophobia is the fear of movement. And very often it's very task specific. People are sure that they can't bend because they will have pain. Again, much attention to external focus, much evidence that it's more effective for performance and learning. Does external focus trigger an ex exercise induced hyperalgesia? We really don't know. There are no studies to support or refute this notion. We, in the clinic, we think it does, but there's no, re there's no research on this. So if you combine all these, the goal action coupling, if you combine them all, um, that's really what it comes down to. I've already mentioned that you get improvements in learning, memory, cognition, by brain and structure, functional connectivities. So an external focus of attention increases the automaticity of control. So it becomes a brain exercise. The brain learns how to train. So if you look at why does it work? Why do we get improved performance? Why do we get uh, task readying? There's some background noise here, as you may have learned. Uh, that's a lot of detail, but the bottom line is we should be able to relax our brain. And do we do this with body focus or do we do it with external focus? Clearly, when the focus is on the task, people do better. Here you see another person, she's a physical therapist. On the Jacob's letter, she's giving a cognitive task by looking at what colors, what, what letters to use, what numbers to use. She will execute her skill much better. In the meantime, she's doing hip flexion, knee flexion, everything we wanted to do. Accuracy and quality of the movement depends on a great extent 
on the attention she has while she does this exercise. So it also improves learning. So people with learning disabilities, children with learning focus activities do much better with an internal focus of exercise. It actually improves their academic, improves their academic performance. In fact, an internal focus can hinder learning relative to an ex external focus. And it may be hard to believe, but the research is all there. So when you go back to your clinic, try to integrate these things. Autonomy, expectations, external focus, couple them all together, focus on the task while on the patient's body. You see other uh, examples. I used to play sports all the time and um, having my illnesses kind of ended that um, for me, um, at least for the time being. So to come here and to actually see equipment that get me active and kind of allow me to um, embody my sports and athlete persona again is just terrific and thrilling. So I was so excited. I couldn't wait to get on the equipment. The problem with this approach is that it usually takes a few sessions. You don't see the results immediately. Patients usually have the response like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I, I did it, but it may take a few sessions before you see a response. It's great for children. It's great for elderly people. It's great for balance training, yeah, extra, extra gaming, external focus, extra gaming. Uh, it's great, great to treat anxiety, depression. And when you put them all together, you have what we call the external focus optimal motor learning theory of learning. Well, thanks, Jan, for going through the theory portion of things. What we'll get started on here is the clinical reasoning and application, really what we do in our clinic when we have patients. And specifically, we'll highlight a couple of patients with chronic pain who otherwise may have failed a traditional approach um, or internal focused type of physical therapy. Next. In respect to clinical reasoning, it's going to start with the subjective evaluation. So every patient in front of us, we need to realize what their values and their goals are and how can we integrate externally focused exercise to help meet those goals. Next. And really, we need to figure out whether or not they're a candidate for external focused exercise from the beginning. From a biological standpoint, this means ruling out red flags. In our clinic, we have patients who have cervical instability and tethered cord, other systemic illnesses who may limit their ability to succeed with external focus. Additionally, we have to think about the tissue health, where they're at in respect to healing. We can't throw them into any exercise and expect them to get better. It may exceed their capacity. That's an important concept as well. Psychologically, are they ready to get better? Are they ready to commit to improving? Are they motivated to do so? And socially, do they have the support in respect to family support and also uh, financially. Next. So this is Belgium. We are in Antwerp for the World Conference of Low Back and Pelvic Pain. And we're taking a movement break here. Jan and I sat through lecture after lecture discussing chronic pain. And the consensus was these patients need to move and exercise but the barriers to do so were, were obviously fairly great. And we were sitting there thinking we had the perfect solution to that with our mode of exercise. Next. So we know with our patients that have chronic pain, their nervous system is hypervigilant or overprotective. So these synapses associated with simple movements or movements that should not be painful oftentimes are, and we could start with maybe a few movements, oftentimes spreads to several to the point where they're not very functional at all and are quite afraid to move. So where do we begin? Next. In our clinic, we really just try to start with having some type of success, whatever that is. So this is one game I may play with patients. It's just a gross motor skill with a fairly simple task, nothing too complex, but we need to show the patient that they can move and be successful. So this could be ankle, hip, knee, rehab. It may not really matter early on. I just need to show them that they can be successful with moving. So the low hanging fruit here. Next. So inevitably the patient may ask you or they might be confused why you're taking them into what looks like a Dave and Buster's gym to do physical therapy. And similar to what Jan said is we're really maybe tricking the brain or bypassing the circuit is what I like to tell them. Just a simple analogy uh, to help them get going and understand why we're doing what we're doing. Next. Can you go back one more, Jan? 
So most pain science experts would agree graded exposure and graded activity are really fundamental in getting patients with chronic pain better. And we believe that external focus is arguably the best way you can do that. So the success builds success is really true to that. And once a patient realizes they can do things they thought otherwise they couldn't, you can really start to build on those blocks and um, rapidly uh, great exposure and activity. Next. But what about the barriers from the physical therapist? We all spend a lot of time in school and postgraduate training learning specific ways to exercise and proper ways to exercise what we think is proper, but perhaps that's not always the case in these situations, particularly in chronic pain conditions. Next. This is Greg Lehman. He's a chiropractor, physical therapist, researcher. He spent a lot of time debunking uh, the thought that certain biomechanics are inherently bad or faulty or always causative of pain. And I like what he says here, rather than a viewing, viewing a movement as faulty, perhaps it's just sensitive. And I, and I would agree with that. A lot of times our patients are sensitive to movements and we need to build them up rather than limit them to doing certain things. Next. So this is some research to support that. JOSPD just published this. And what they looked at was risk factors for low back pain in regards to lifting with flexion. And they found it was not predictive of uh, people developing low back pain whatsoever. So not a lot of strong evidence for the old adage of lifting with your legs, not your back. It doesn't mean there aren't times when patients may need to avoid that temporarily, but ultimately we need to expose them to lifting and using their back. Next. This would support that as well. If you look at these strong men, they're obviously not concerned about neutral spine here. So a lot of times in physical therapy school, we, that was the holy grail, neutral spine. But in reality, we need to be prepared to do multiple movements, including lifting and extension and flexion at times. So these strong men are lifting very heavy stone atlas and are unable to avoid neutral spine, but they're okay because they're prepared and they have the capacity to do these movements. Next. And then the other one that's fairly common is a valgus with patellofemoral pain and ACL prevention. So we know that valgus is a biomechanical risk, but can we change it to a different story? So this research study looked at a ACL prevention program, and what they found was the kinematics didn't change. Their ability to stabilize and uh, co-contract around their hamstrings and quads improved at initial contact with cutting, but the valgus did not. And I think it's pretty unreasonable to assume our athletes are going to go back or anyone is going to go back to their regular life and avoid all these uh, biomechanics. Instead, we need to prepare them to move in all these ways and graded exposure and, and build them up. Next. So here's my patient, and that's obviously a great demonstration of valgus on both knees here. And it would be pretty frustrating for her and also probably not get us very far for me to stop her and correct her valgus because one, I don't think she could do it. And two, I don't think it would necessarily change her outcomes. We need to build her up and show her she can do more in this case rather than limit her. Next. So that's just a little background on what's going through my head with some of my patients and some of the research. I'm going to present a case series of three patients, which is an expansion of an article that Jan and I wrote in a German, uh, German um, journal. And we presented the case series in Belgium as well. Next. With every patient, when I start, I'm thinking about these subgroups of pain, realizing that they're not going to fall into just one. There is an overlap, but perhaps I can uh, rank them, or if it's a pie chart, I can break it into different categories, and maybe one is more than the other, and that will help me with my initial clinical reasoning and decision-making as well with these patients. Next. So here's the first patient. She's a 47-year-old female. She had a fall at work and subsequent uh, lumbar and sacral fusion. And for two years, she was miserable. She had extreme pain with anything related to lumbar flexion. She could not run or jump at all. Any ground reaction force was perceived as painful. She couldn't sit very long. And, and worse for her was she couldn't play soccer. So she loved playing soccer. It was her passion. She was told she had to give it up because of her injuries. Next. So if we break it down into the BPS model again, from a bio standpoint, sure, she had some tissues that were involved with her pain patterns and her inputs, but compounding on that was her fear of moving and the thought that she had a fragile or unstable back that really had limited her ability to progress. 
Next. From a psychological standpoint, she reported that she, was, um, she had some anger issues and some anxiety, but she was getting depressed because her identity was wrapped up on being physically active and playing soccer to some degree. Next. And socially, she was the primary support giver for her family, so perhaps she didn't really have a whole lot of support herself. Next. Where do we start with most patients, and particularly in this case, was educating her. So we have a medical team that confirmed that the fusion was stable, so we needed to let her know that it was okay to move and she wasn't going to blow her back up or whatever she thought was going to happen with flexion because she had been told that by other people, and that's what she uh, grew to think. But no, it was safe to move, and there's no reason she couldn't get back to playing soccer. So we reassured her and then ultimately let her know that just because you have some pain, perhaps, when we get you moving here, it doesn't mean you damage anything again. It perhaps is just part of the process. Next. So I obviously needed to get her moving her spine, flexing, and start to load it. And where I started with her is this laser maze. So rather than tell her to bend her back and rotate and flex, I just told her to try to get to the other side and hit the light. And she did that quite fine. She actually enjoyed it. And that was a great entry point for us to show that, okay, it was fine for her to move and we can start the process. Next. She responded very well and we were able to ramp it up. So here's a sit up. Whoever thought, you know, who said a sit up was a bad exercise. For her, it was great. We we're able to introduce a harder version of lumbar flexion, put a little bit more stress to the system in a good way, and all the while have fun. She's just looking at, to hit the target. So she needs to rotate a little bit as well. Really great way for her to start flexing again. Next. Then we can make them a little more dynamic. She had to lift things at work. So I'm not telling her to engage her core or how to bend. She just is hitting the targets and we can slowly make the resistance a little greater as we get closer to return to work. Next. So this is someone who couldn't run or uh, jump when she came into the clinic. And this was probably about three months later She's doing all these activities. We'll play the next video. Three. Another combination One. of rotation, flexion, Three. multitasking. And we'll play the last video. One. Two. Three. Next. One. I get two. Medical saliva. Three. Drop it. Exercise. So. That may look similar to something you might already do in the clinic. We're just adding a slight external focus here to give her some motiv motivation and Great help her be a little bit more successful. Next. One. And of course, throughout the process, we played soccer with her and slowly built her up to the point she could go back and play some recreational games. Next. If you look at her outcomes, she did great. She was able to go back to work. Her pain was much less. She could sit through an entire game to watch her kids play soccer. And if we look at this graph here, these are isometric values of her ability to um, load her spine. So we have a chest press, a leg press, a core pull, and a vertical lift, which is, which is basically a deadlift. And you can see over 60 days, her ability to create an output or withstand certain force uh, increased greatly. Next. So this is Michael, I'll let you listen to his story. Some chronic pain since 2010. Started off when I perceived as um, muscle pulls, um, which led to widespread pain accompanied by extremely tense muscles. Uh, basically, uh, my muscles were locked in spasm. Uh, I've been in and out of multiple physical therapy clinics um, since that time um, that you would describe as uh, traditional. Um, with chronic pain, I found there is a uh, hyper focus on the pain. Um, and the body part that uh, I'm experiencing the pain. Anything that I perceive uh, contributing towards the pain, I stopped doing. Soon I was doing nothing. Um, I couldn't walk more than five blocks. I couldn't sit down. I couldn't lay down. Even. My quality of life was uh, very low. Um, my first experience with Dr. Gaming was in late 2018. Immediately I could uh, notice a difference. I was no longer focusing on the pain um, or the muscles involved with the pain or the movements that I thought contributed towards the pain. Um, both the external focus and working with a trained physiotherapist uh, were key. 
uh, compared to you know a traditional physical therapy clinic where um, you would uh, focus on exercises of isolating one muscle, contracting on or concentrating on contracting other muscles while engaging muscles that felt uh, pretty unnatural to me. Also, the movements didn't feel natural to me. Uh, I was actually engaging in normal movements that typically involve several body parts um, or even my entire body um, when uh, engaging in exodema. Um, we started off slow, but immediately I had uh, asked my therapist um, how they were doing what they were doing, um, how I was able to do um, what I didn't perceive I could do for so long. Um, so looking back at it, that's for gaming, it was fun. Uh, it built my confidence, uh, built uh, my muscles in my entire body um, in a coordinated way. Uh, and I think most importantly, it changed my perspective on my hands, well, the capabilities, uh, my capabilities and the limits that I was placing on myself. Thank you. What Mike said there in regards to internal focus exercise versus external, I think is pretty typical with a lot of our patients we get in chronic pain. They tend to do much better with uh, normal functional external focus movements than these internal focus exercise, which can be quite frustrating for them and, and really get them nowhere. And they kind of spin in circles. And uh, before I worked at a clinic unique like the one we do, I, I've also been in that circle with these patients. So it's definitely been eye opening for me to see some of these changes using an extra gaming approach. But um, like he said, 10 years. So this is a long time to have chronic pain, obviously pretty frustrating. Next. He had mentioned he couldn't walk very far or sitting on low surfaces was out of the question, but he really came to us because he had a newborn and picking um, him out of the crib would create back spasms or even just the thought of it would start to create back spasm in him. So he realized this was starting to really interfere with his life. Next. So this is me, this is not Mike, but the first day I saw him, if I asked him to pick something off the ground, that's how he would do it. He was terrified of bending, wouldn't bend past 30 degrees at his hips. If I tried to do the slump test with him, just showing him this picture, he would go into sweats. He'd be terrified of doing that as well. So when I finally did um, coach him through it, he got to about 45 degrees and he had extreme apprehension. So we just stopped there. And what I did was I took him down to um, the extra gaming gym. Next. And um, okay, well, first a little bit of bio on him. So he obviously had some trigger points and some neurodynamic issues, but most importantly, in this case, he's very sensitized. He had 10 years of pain. He was frustrated and he needed to get moving. Next. So he mentioned he was anxious. Yeah, rightfully so. He had multiple misdiagnosis and failed treatments. Ultimately, myofascial pain syndrome was something that stuck with him because it, he did get some benefit from um, treatment of his muscles, but he was pretty stuck in a rough place. Next. And socially, he couldn't really get out and <clears throat> and participate in some of these baby groups with his newborn, it was difficult because he was uncomfortable all the time and he was not ready to get out and do those type of things. Next. So same thing we just started prior, we, uh, some pain science regarding for him that his system's being a little hypervigilant, overprotective. Sure, he had some trigger points, but that's just one input um, versus you know his output is a totally different experience or there's multiple inputs to go into that. So sure, muscles are one part and we can treat those, but there's other things at play and that's why we need to do some exercise and get some other interventions involved. And most importantly for him, this is reversible. So his nervous system's adaptable and we can make changes. Next. So the first day after I saw him bend, uh, bend like that, I took him down to the gym and I put him on the Jacob's ladder and all I told him to do was hit these green pieces of tape on each rung and obviously, in order to do that and go up the ladder, you have to bend around 70, 80 degrees sometimes, much more than he was willing to do when I asked him to. Next. The same day, I also took him over to the sports wall, and we played basketball. He used to play basketball. He loves it. I just had him hit the low targets, and he was able to bend much more when he was just hitting the targets. I gave him some reassurance. It was okay to move, and he did quite well. Next. Within a couple of weeks, we can start to load that progression of bending. Here's a game that we like to do in the clinic. They throw the bag down, hit the targets, and have to pick them up. They're not thinking about how they're bending uh, or that they're putting strain on their back muscles, et cetera. They're just lifting it up, hitting the next target, trying to get a high score. Next. 
And also realizing that uh, the movement and extra gaming was one portion of it. We also gave him some resources, some mindfulness, explained pain, and some support groups, all of which helped him to his ultimate outcome. Next. So at six months, Mike was deadlifting 50 pounds from the floor. This is the guy who would barely pick his shoe off the ground um, uh, when we first got him. So interesting, he made some pretty rapid changes in his ability to see that he could do more than he thought he could, but it was a process to get him fully back to healthy or rehab him. But at one year, he came into my office. He didn't even have an appointment. He stopped in and told me that he could finally envision living a life without pain, which is pretty powerful, um, one of the more meaningful experiences in my career thus far. Next. So we'll go to our final case. This patient is going to fit more the neuropathic pain pattern. She fell from her horse. She fractured her sacrum, had a sacroplasty, and the cement got adhered to her L5 nerve root. Then that had to be removed, and she was left with some neuropathic pain and muscle weakness. Next. So from a objective standpoint, she was weak in her glutes. She had a trendelaber gait. She had a drop foot. This was all neurological weakness, and she had severe allodynia, L4, L5. Next. Biologically, the axonal damage, the neuropathic pain, and, and the weakness associated with such. Next. Psychologically, she was very fear, fearful and depressed that she would be permanently damaged or impaired. She had a lot of anger at the physician, and her identity, you know, with um, being a physically active person, it started to disappear. Next. And socially, she was a high power lobbyist. So how would she be perceived at work? And could she even go back to work? These were all concerns for her. Next. So getting into my mind, what do I need to do with her? Well, I need to desensitize her foot and ankle. I need to improve her mobility and strength. I need to let her know that she can move again and be successful, but um, have some fun. She's obviously depressed about the whole situation. How can I help her heal overall? Next. So this is uh, one of the first couple sessions. She had very poor ankle control, and she had a difficult time working walking on normal surfaces. So I put her on the trampoline, and I told her to try to uh, be like an airplane, keep her arms level. So very simple external focus. But what's going on here is I'm, I gave her a softer surface to desensitize her foot, and then I gave her a compliant surface to help stabilize her because her ankle control and strategies were not that great at that point. Next. So, uh, we talked about the glute weakness. Rather than give her single leg stance activities, which she really couldn't do and was frustrating, I had her try to hit the targets with her right foot. So each target that she hits, she has to obviously stabilize with her left, and she can start to build some balance and strength and, again, desensitize her allodynia and her neuropathic condition. Next. <laughs> I tried early on to do internal focus strengthening of her glutes, and we got absolutely nowhere. I actually got to tears because she was pretty frustrated. So rather than do that, I started to incorporate more external focus exercise. As you see here, she was much more successful with that. And then ultimately, we did get back to some internal focus stuff later on to build some strength, but she probably would not have got there that quick and without this type of uh, early intervention using external focus. Next. And then lastly, she's an active person, so we need some dynamic activities. And here's more towards uh, the later stage of rehab. She is able to move and be a little more agile and put more stress to the foot without uh, having such hyperalgesia. Um, outcome, she returned to work. Pain improved. Her gait was much better. Next, around eight months, you know, her family didn't really recognize her in the, as impaired, and the untrained eye would also not have picked up on that when she was in her AFO. She had some residual drop foot, but her glute strength uh, came back uh, pretty much five out of five and restored confidence with work, relationships, all the above, and had a, a pretty good outcome. Next. So in conclusion, this is a, a very powerful modality to confront patients with what their beliefs are at the current time and show them that they can probably do more than they think they can do. That being said, you still have to have some clinical reasoning uh, with this type of exercise because you could potentially hurt someone if they're not ready or flare them up depending on where they're at with their nervous system and what they're ready to do at any given time. So every patient is a little different. Some we start external focus right away. Others we have to maybe build some confidence other ways first. 
but it can be obviously pretty powerful as you saw there. And keep in mind, this is graded exposure to sure their joints and their soft tissues and muscles, but also their nervous system. So where they're at in regards to kinesiophobia and fear of movement and anxiety, we have to keep that in respect as well. Next. From the physical therapy standpoint, you really have to buy in and, and let go of some of these other paradigms and realize there's not just one way to exercise. For me, once I've done that, it's really helped prevent some burnout and realize that sometimes I can um, take the pressure off myself and go down to the gym and do some external focus stuff. One, because it can help the patient, but two, it just really changed the, the thought process a little bit. And it's been a game changer for our patients for sure. Next. Jan, if you want to wrap up a little bit and just your closing yeah. thoughts here. So um, I have a tradition of ending every lecture the same way. So I always think that, as you can see, the clinician must listen to the patient, do what's going on, must always search for answers. It's time to believe your patient. We need to work together with others, including the patient. Very important. We do not learn from experience, but we learn from reflecting on those experiences. And by doing that, we can actually have the patient experience that they leave the pain and enjoy the journey, like Mike did and of the other patients. Of course, some patients' problems are unresolvable and we have to come up with different solutions or maybe refer them to other people. So this brings us kind of to the end of this webinar, but there are several people who ask questions. So if you need to go, because it's now three o'clock in the morning in Pakistan, uh, as I realize, uh, we understand that. We will send you the, the the thing. If you have questions, you can ask them now. Put them in your question box in the uh, control panel. Um, before we go, we will answer all the questions as long as we need to, unless it takes really, really long time. But most questions we will be here. I want to point out to you real briefly, these are the, what we call the Beyond Dry Needling webinars. We have several more coming up. We also will go back to some live chats with our instructors. Um, here's the schedule coming up. Next week, we have functional fascia therapeutics by Ryan Shepard. Then we have a manual trigger point therapy approach. And then we have three sessions on pelvic issues. Gerard Green from the UK will talk about bridging the gap. Musculoskeletal and sports demands health physical therapy. Blair Green from Atlanta, Georgia will talk about dry needling for pelvic pain and dysfunction. I know it's beyond dry needling, but pelvic pain dry needling is a little beyond regular dry needling. Uh, Colleen Whiteford will talk about orthopedics and pelvic health. You may have seen her in the fascia manipulation lecture. I will be talking about whiplash on June 23rd. And on June 30, Michiel Trau from the Netherlands from uh, the Crafter program is going to talk, talk us about uh, treatment options for tinnitus from a neuromusculoskeletal point of view. Lastly, before we go to your questions, we are offering these lectures free of charge. We are supporting the No Kid Hungry campaign here in the US. A lot of children are, children are in terrible trouble because they get school lunches. Schools are all closed all over the country. So a lot of children are actually suffering dramatically with, without nutritious food. So we'd like you to, in the link that you get from us after this webinar, there's an, in the email is a link where we're gonna ask you to contribute and, and whatever you can. If everyone would just contribute $1, it would be almost $200 extra just based on this one webinar. So let's get to the questions. Nate and I will both answer your questions as much as we can. Remember, it's not the answers that we give you, but your questions that is really where the enlightenment is. So here you have our email addresses. I'll leave this up for you so you can always email us. We're happy to uh, to discuss uh, things with you and answer questions in email. If you ever, whenever you can travel again and you come to the Washington DC area, you wanna see this yourself, you want to hang out in this equipment and play with this equipment, just give us an email, send us a note, and we'll be happy to accommodate you. So let's look at a few questions. Nate, are you ready? Yep. You looking at me already? Yep. You want me to read them off? Yeah, why don't you start? I have them in front of me too, but why don't you start? read the sure. question first? Sounds good. What about any differences in skill retention with internal versus external cues? And I know you touched on this briefly, but do you want to expand upon that? Yeah, what actually been shown in, in research by Losey and by uh, Wolf and uh, Luthwaite as well, that with internal focus, the retention is actually quite poor. And you see that in the clinic, you could tell people how to do a core stability exercise and the next week they come back and they really don't remember it. You tell people 
you give people an exercise where they chase a ball or do something or run on a trampoline, they will come back or the laser makes in our clinic, strictly external focus. People come back and say like, can I do that again? That was so much fun. And you know what? I could actually do it. So even though patients don't experience it as a retention, the retention is much better with an external focus approach. Yeah, I, I agree. I, th I think we see that in the in the clinic all the time, and the research would support that as well. How would you add an external focus to relaxing muscle activity? Example, clenching. That is a great question. That's a question from Janie. Hi, Janie. How are you? Yeah, um, my thought process with that, Jan, is that clenching and sometimes these um, holding patterns are a central phenomenon, and that perhaps that rather than focusing on the clenching and bringing it up all the time, which is an internal focus, that there may be some uh, usefulness. And I've seen this with patients to really do a bunch of external focus exercise with them and um, get them off thinking about or not thinking about clenching as much. And sometimes we see some beneficial results with that, particularly with patients who have really tight um, pelvic floors sometimes, for instance. Uh, we see once we just do general movements, incorporate the whole body, sometimes that gets better. And then uh, also with uh, jaw and TMJ as well sometimes. Yeah, and I would like to add to, to that. I totally agree with you, Nate. And there's something else, another component to that. What and in our article, German article, we actually talk about that. What a lot of chronic pain programs do, they focus on um, uh, a more of a cognitive behavioral approach, and they list have the patient list all the things they are worried about, all the things that they can't do. And then in the clinic, they actually go through those activities. Um, and if you do that. I can't help but think that you confront their patients with their fears all the time, which will improbably increase their clenching behavior because they're fearful of doing it. In an external focus, we don't really mention it other than the first visit. We, we'd like to get an idea of what's going on so that we can plan our activities accordingly. But once you get people out of that mindset that they need to worry about their clenching jaw muscles or pelvic floor muscles or any other muscle for that matter, uh, and let people experience that they can do things that clenching usually automatically decreases. So we actually see this even more, even as a counter approach to the more cognitive behavioral approach. Uh, and again, they're not mutually exclusive. We use cognitive behavioral tools as well in our clinic, but most of the time we let people experience that they can be successful without having to do the, the protective behaviors. I mean, in the case of Mike, he was very clear about it, but it was a long process. I mean, Nate and I both mm. helped him with this process. And at one point he would say like, I just don't understand that when I do this at home, my, my hamstring muscles, he always focused on his hamstrings, very strong internal focus. And I'm on this table now for 40 minutes and I haven't had any problems. Or I could do the Jacob's ladder and it didn't hurt at all. But after Nate got him on the Jacob's ladder and then said, can you now squat? He said, oh, I can't do that, my hamstrings. And he went immediately back to that. As soon as he was confronted with the internal focus, he immediately went back to the disability. I think that's a great point. Yeah. Well, how would you implement uh, to establish self-efficacy driven aspect of exercises, especially, especially delivering home programs since external focus programs require some sort of equipment? Actually, we don't give people home exercises all that much anymore because once people experience that they can be successful all they need to do at home is move and you don't need any equipment you can use a balloon for for, for all i care you can use a ball you can use a, a can of beans it doesn't matter what you use you can be as creative as you want <clears throat> so for the home exercise part like in mike's case we basically told him to um if someone's calling me let me just cut that up uh, we basically told him start moving that is the most important thing. Trust yourself that you can do this. So we don't give people a lot of home exercises to do at home. Once self-efficacy is improved, everything else usually falls in place. Yeah, I think that's pretty accurate. I, I know with Mike too, again, we didn't give him a whole lot of exercises. Some things, if you really wanted to work on at home, I would try to replicate as best we could in the clinic. For instance, the sports wall we saw that I was working on, it's not hard to get a basketball. So I had him uh, buy a basketball and make his own targets at home, dribbling and, and touching different targets. So it doesn't have to be high tech like it is in our clinic all the time. You can supplement it with things like that, that again, are more functional and are still externally focused. 
So we'll move so on Robbie to the next. Has a question. Yeah, Robbie is, is actually from Pakistan, and we know each other because she's certified in dry needling. As a matter of fact, Robbie is the only physical therapist in Pakistan certified in dry needling, by my opinion. So thank you for joining us again. It must be in the middle of the night for you by now. So, but Robbie has a question. Um, wants to know how often we should have a patient come in for this kind of extra gaming. And what do you think, Nate? Well, how often that's a good question. Yeah, um, it's going to be case by case. I would say early on with most patients, we start once a week for about a month with the rare cases when we might do twice a week for a month, depending on what their current level of fitness is, how sensitized they are, and what their goals are. But never more than twice a week and usually once a week for about a month or so. And then we can scale it based on how they're responding, whether they think they need more, um, where they're at. Typically, we would extend that another couple of months after they start to get some success, uh, but it will depend patient by patient. As we saw in Mike's case, I mean, it went up to a year on and off. He would come into the clinic and extra games. So some patients, a handful of months perhaps, and then in some other cases, up to a year. There's another interesting question from Stephen. Have you worked with complex regional pain syndrome? And how did they space, these patients seem to respond to the external exercise program? Um, I have not had any patients with complex regional pain syndrome in the current settings that we have, but I have certainly treated people in the past with that. And um, it's very much the same idea. Uh, one patient comes to mind who had it in her foot, could not really bear weight on it, and was always very concerned about what to do. Um, and we did very low tech stuff in, in, in the other clinic where we don't have all these toys and it worked perfectly fine. It took her a little bit to gather attention of it and having all these toys available on the quote our playground makes it a lot easier. But if you don't have these things, you'd, you'd be amazed how much you can do with a simple balloon. So if someone can't or think they can't with weight on their foot, you distract them with the balloon or something that they have to keep up in the air or try to do some juggling exercises, even if they can't do it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it does transfer. Of course, the, hot, the more sensitized people are, the more the central nervous system involved, the harder it's gonna to be to change that focus of attention. Yeah, I, I agree with that as well. I haven't worked directly with CRPS patients in the clinic, in that particular clinic, uh, the closest thing I would say is some neuropathic pain patients that were very sensitized. And the process was just like you had mentioned, trying to, to gradually expose them to doing things without them thinking about it. So I know we had one more, or another question here. Is there any reliability study about external focus exercise? I'm not sure what that means. I saw that question, decided to skip it. I know who asked it, so I figured I'll, I'll email Yazam a little bit later. Um, it's kind of late in Qatar too, actually, but I'm not sure what you mean, Yazan, with a reliability study on the exercise itself. Whether you're asking is there reliability on making a determination of when to do this or how to do that? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there are not, but I'm not really sure that I understand the question, what, what you mean with reliability regarding to an exercise program. Uh, that's not totally clear to me, but we can talk yeah, about know who you are, know where you are. No, go ahead. I was going to say, that as far as I'm aware, there isn't really much research on pain and external focus exercise. There's some exergaming research with pain patients, uh, some fibromyalgia, a couple articles and some shoulder pain, but there really isn't a whole lot on using this type of exercise with pain. Yeah. So it's well, also important more... that kind of ties, part of that ties into ahead. this, that an external focus approach is actually quite common in pediatric physical therapy. Where you, I mean, I used to do pediatric physical therapy a long time ago, and you're always playing games. You're always doing things and balls and, and toys and all that stuff. In orthopedics and pain management, I would think it's quite rare that people use this. Um, so there, as far as I know, there is no research for pain population, and I, I'm not aware of any of it. And even when I talked to Wolf and Luthwaite, I attended one of their workshops, they did not really have a lot of input regarding chronic pain patients. They've done research on multiple sclerosis and Parkinson and other patient populations. But as far as I know, they've never looked at chronic pain populations as far as that, 
far as I'm aware of. I'm not, not sure. Okay, a few more questions. Any thoughts on type of practice? Uh, example, mass versus block for exercise design and progression. What does that mean, mass versus blocked? I don't really get that. Um, they're typically with designs for motor, they're motor control terms for how you design a program. And I would say really, yeah. it, it, we're not probably that scripted in how we do our exercise mm -hmm. in the extra gaming clinic because it's a little spontaneous. We don't really know how the patient's gonna react to certain exercises. Uh, what maybe they'll respond to, what goes well, what doesn't go well. So early on, we're not that scripted in regards to mass versus block. So anything probably more random, um, if that answers your question. And then as we progress, we may eventually get into more mass and block type of treatment scenarios when we're really trying to condition them. But early on, more random for sure. And another great question from Deb. Any suggestions for low tech? And uh, there's a two part compression to the a question here. The, for low tech, look around and use whatever you want. It could be a piece of string, it could be a, a, a ball, it could be anything. I'll give you one example. Uh, our partner, Mark Sickle, who is on this uh, webinar as well, once had a little boy, five year old kid, who um, comes in the clinic. He's on the autistic spectrum. And this little boy was clear he thought everything was stupid and he didn't want to do anything. So the challenge was how can we get through him? Uh, the, all this fancy equipment was clearly not of his interest. But five-year-old boys are into certain certain bodily functions. So the next time this boy came back, uh, Mark had uh, plastered plastic dog poop all over a climbing wall with the just with Velcro, just stuck it on. Very low tech. You can buy that at a dollar store probably. I don't know where, toy store, wherever you buy that. And Basically said something, oh my goodness, I can't believe someone left the door open, that neighborhood dog, and then look what a mess this dog created. And this little boy looked at it, saw all this dog poop, plastic dog poop, obviously, on the wall and basically said, oh, I could help you with that. But that sounds like a fun thing to do. And before he knew, the kid was climbing the wall and was sold into the external focus approach. So. The low tech is basically whatever you see around you and be creative, get out of your, your preconceived notions about what you should use in exercise. You can use anything. Uh, anything you want to add to that, Nate? No, I think that's a great point. For the second part of her uh, question, she discusses, uh, I see your point regarding form, but what about, for instance, substitution overhead with adhesive capsulitis and what we think about perhaps like, in those situations? And what I would say is, if I really thought their form was going to further perpetuate their pain and sensitivity, I would adjust the cueing or the external focus to uh, allow for less compensation. So you can always change the type of exercise they're doing to scale it accordingly to what you think is appropriate. That would go back into your clinical reasoning, but some types of form I'm not concerned about and others perhaps I might be, and that's how I would adjust accordingly. So there's another question from James. How long did it take to put the toys together in your clinic? Well, we were very fortunate because all the toys were there already when we heard about this clinic. And by talking to the owner, we actually added physical therapy to an existing space that had more of a pediatric uh, focus of children with, with learning disabilities, children with the autistic spectrum. So we didn't really actually have to put this together. It was already in place for us. So that was actually very, very nice. If you would consider doing this, I would say you don't need the entire clinic that we have. We have a lot of toys. We have a huge playground. Remember the third slide that showed you that there's different forms of playgrounds. One just has a swing or maybe some a seesaw or something. That's all you need in the beginning. Uh, we like simple things. You can use some fairly inexpensive light systems that you can stick on many different situations. Um, and there's different systems on that. You can email us, we can give you some advice if you want. Um, you wouldn't have to do the whole clinic. First of all, that would be kind of cost prohibitive probably. It's quite expensive to do all these stories, uh, but you don't need all that. You can, you can use a lot of low tech, you can use relatively inexpensive, higher tech piece of equipment and slowly build on what, what you already have. And well, the yeah, next question- 
Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Virtual reality, yes, exactly. I was going to ask you, what about virtual reality exercises, and can they be categorized as external focus? I know we've talked about this recently. Do you want to um, go ahead and talk about that? Yeah. Virtual reality is, is kind of a funny concept because, in a way, you transform the person into a totally external world that looks so incredibly real. So yes, it is definitely a form of external focus practice. Uh, we've actually, we're looking into that now as well. And um, you can even combine it with um, uh, omnidirectional treadmills. So you can have a patient on an omnidirectional treadmill. So no matter which direction you walk, you make a left turn, right turn, backwards, forward, the treadmill will follow that. It's basically a circle or a square people stand on. Uh, to really, really make it in a very fascinating virtual reality world and an external focus. And uh, we don't have this yet in our clinic. We are exploring this a little bit. There are a lot of systems on the market. Um, and they don't really have to be all that expensive either. There's very high end and very low end. Uh, and th th that is a great addition, a great example of doing this as well. There are even systems where you as the therapist can also enter the same virtual world uh, as the patient. So you can actually be there with the patient in this new reality. So that's even more enticing. Even if now if you do telehealth, you could send a set to the patient, you could sit at your desk, at your computer, and both be in the same world doing whatever movement, whatever external focus you want to be in, giving the patient, again, autonomy and enhanced expectancies. Good stuff. I think we got one more question, and this was in respect to any studies looking at external focus exercise and scoliosis, because the Schroff method is more of an internal focus, and uh, they were looking for a comparison between the two and maybe benefits of using external focus. I am not aware of any study with scoliosis with this approach. Uh, they may exist, but I honestly don't know. I'm not sure either. If I find it, I'll send it to you, Parsha. I see who you asked the question. Um, I'm happy to send it to you, but I, I honestly don't know of any question like this. So if you have any other questions, our email is still on the screen. You can always email us, or and again, if you're in the area, once you can travel again, feel free to visit us. And uh, with that, I uh, would like to thank you all. We took you a little bit longer than uh, we had planned, but that's okay. A little technical difficulty there in the middle when we switched to presenters. Um, we hope to see you next week at our next webinar, same time, same place. And good night to some of you and enjoy dinner for some others. Thank you for attending.